evening, everybody, and um, welcome to the fifth lecture in this mini BMB medical school. Um, I was very excited last week, and I'm sure uh, you agree with me that that was great. And um, you may have thought, could it be any better? And so tonight we have a surprise for you, because yes, it can be better. And again, I'm sure after tonight's lecture you will agree with me. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Daniel Lowenstein, um, got, received his MD from Harvard and did his residency here at UCSF. His interest is in epilepsy and um, he does many, many things. So he sees patients, he does wonderful research. So uh, as we've mentioned before, this mini medical BMB is uh, based on the real course that the medical students are going through right now. And guess who the course director for that course is? Dr. Lowenstein. And in fact, not only is he running the course, he was one of the co-chairs designing this new curriculum that we have now that our students are following. Um, so the out-of-the-box thinking of how we can better teach our students is in part directed by Dr. Lowenstein. Again, um, not only is he thinking about how to teach, he is one of the most well-respected medical educators, educators nationwide. But I would really like to um, introduce Dr. Lowenstein by quoting his colleague, Dr. Cardozo from Harvard Medical School, who said about Dr. Lowenstein, it feels a little like evaluating St. Augustine's ability as a theologian. I feel completely comfortable in saying that Dan is without a doubt the single finest teacher that I have ever encountered. Please welcome Dan. Well, <laughs> well th um, th thank you very much. Can you hear me in the back? Um, so listening to something like that, I, there's just no question in my mind that I do not deserve that kind of introduction. And I think one of my goals for the evening is to make sure that you don't draw the same conclusion. <laughs> um, but no, thank you very much, Marika. That's, that's a, a very nice. Um, so anyway, welcome. It's just really nice to have you here. Uh, so uh, the topic uh, tonight is uh, epilepsy. Uh, and uh, as Marika mentioned, this happens to be the particular area of interest for me uh, professionally as a, as a physician as a, and as a neuroscientist. So, uh, and, and I should say that I've really uh, uh, patterned my lecture almost exactly the way I give the lecture to the medical students. Um, I'll modify it a little bit to try to gauge uh, the, the previous learning that you've had. But this, the overall structure of the lecture uh, is essentially identical. And so we'll, we'll actually begin then with this. So I'd like to start by asking how many people here in the audience uh, have, have experienced epilepsy as part of their family, their, per, their personal lives, or, or their family, right? So a, a, a small percentage. Um, for, tho for those of you who have not, who are not familiar with seeing a person have a seizure or the phenomenon of epilepsy, I, I imagine that watching this kind of behavior must bring on some sense of mystery or if not discomfort. 
It's just not, the behavior seems odd and unusual. And I'll tell you right at the outset, my goal for our evening's discussion is for all of us to go from that beginning point of not being clear exactly what's going on, feeling a sense of mystery, of oddness, of, if not discomfort, to being in a position of completely, totally understanding what is going on in that patient as he's just had a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. That's my goal. We're going to accomplish it, by the way. Okay? And I, 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 I use that as actually uh, to emphasize that that's what the process of becoming a healthcare professional is all about. Certainly among physicians, but other healthcare professionals as well. What I see, what we observe, are students who show up in the first week or so of class, and they don't understand a lot about the physiology of the way the body works and the way diseases can cause uh, illness and suffering. And over the course of months and years, you see them sort of transformed into someone, people, who hopefully still have the same compassion that one must feel as you see someone like this suffering, but having the understanding of the underlying illness. And it, it then relieves them of a lot of the misunderstanding that plagues people who are ill in our society. And so it shouldn't come as any surprise that, that epilepsy, like many other diseases, this is a disease that's been known for a long, long time. Um, this happens to be a tablet uh, with hieroglyphic from a, uh, uh, a, a text that was unearthed in Sultan Tepe, uh, Turkey, in the early 1900s. And it represents writings that refer back to Egyptian times. The writings occurred in seven, 700 BC or so, but they actually refer to the observations made by Egyptian physicians in 3000 BC. So this is a disease that has been observed in humans for 5,000 years. And Given the nature of the behavior of people with seizures and epilepsy, um, uh, you won't be surprised to think that it's very quite misunderstood. Now, now a couple definitions are in order here. First of all, epilepsy comes uh, from the Greek epilepsia, which refers to a seizure, the event that we're going to talk about. And seizure is derived from the Latin seizure, which is uh, which means to take possession of, meaning the person who is experiencing a seizure has been possessed by some sort of spirit. And uh, the connotation has always been towards some kind of demonic spirit. And uh, just to emphasize the point a little bit more, uh, here's a, a, a wood cutting from the 1600s showing a group of people uh, taking care of a person who's just collapsed of a seizure. And these are the etiologies of epilepsy that were described during the mid-1800s in a textbook uh, of medicine written by Loray, 1843. It's a curious list, don't you think? Right. Um, uh, so of this group of patients, 35 their seizures were attributed to fear. As we'll learn, that's not completely off target because patients with, who have epilepsy will say that oftentimes their seizures can be induced by stressful situations. Um, but the vast majority had a fear. I don't know about the second one. I don't think that that is that has really proven to be true. Uh, drunkenness, actually alcohol use, has uh, clearly been associated with uh, seizures and epilepsy. Wrath and misery, maybe, in terms of stress, falling, uh, debauchery, insulation. Anyone know what insulation means? Anyone? Exposure to the sun, very good. Actually, medical student, none of the medical students ever know that. So insol, S-O-L, uh, exposure to the sun. Uh, sudden chill, injuries of the head, definitely. Uh, decreasing psoriasis, I don't think there's a connection. Um, difficult dentition, perhaps. Uh, infections are associated with seizures. And heredity, I'm glad that Loray noticed this because actually, uh, even in the time of Hippocrates, who wrote about epilepsy as the sacred disease, hence the title of my talk tonight, um, Hippocrates was very clear at uh, seeing that heredity could play a role. All right, so uh, let's start. Now, the reason you don't have a handout with slides is I didn't think that any of the slides in my set would be very useful to you because they're mostly picture slides like this uh, and some videos. And I'm otherwise going to be using uh, the board. So uh, in order to begin the discussion of what is going on in the brain of a person who's having a seizure, we have to have some way of, of measurement. And 
this is not a trivial problem, right? Because the, as you guys have learned, the brain is encased in this skull. And certainly up through the 1800s, it was very difficult to define much at all of what, what was going on in the brain. You know, it was only a, in the previous couple hundred years that people had finally decided that much of what we currently attribute to the nervous system actually occurred in the brain, right? There was a big discussion of heart versus brain, liver versus heart versus brain. Um, and part of that was because of the difficulty of observing um, uh, the brains, and certainly in humans. Electrical act activity of the brain was only really defined in the latter part of the 1800s. And that was done in animal preparations in which people, as they developed some of the devices for measuring electrical potential, were able to apply it to animal brains. But the human, of course, is different. I mean, the only time you have access to the brain is in the case of an injury if the patient's still alive or at death and when it loses its electrical act activity. So the key step in our beginning of the understanding of epilepsy was the development of the electroencephalogram, or the EEG. And this occurred in the 1920s. A German named Hans Berger um, developed a technique for measuring this. And here's, here's the essentials of how it worked. Um, let's see, we'll do, here's, here's just a side view of the brain, which you've been looking at. And we'll put, and here's the person. And what was done was, it was learned that if you took electrodes, flat metal pieces, and placed them on the surface of the brain like this, in various places across the, the scalp, and then measured the electrical activity in an oscilloscope, and one measured the potential differences between pairs of electrodes, right? That's the way one measures electrical activity, that what was observed was this sort of chaotic activity. Okay? And this, this is what the first EEG looked like, a tracing across an oscilloscope, which was representing the, pair, the differences between pairs of electrodes. Pretty amazing, actually, because the electrodes were sitting you know, up here on the scalp, and they were recording electrical activity from the surface of the brain some centimeters away. So this couldn't possibly represent the activity of just individual neurons. I mean, right, these neurons are like tiny, tiny. You can barely see them by the naked eye. You have to use a microscope. And yet we were able to pick up electrical activity of the surface of the brain. Well, the reason for that is that at this surface, closest to the scalp, if one were to draw it out like this in higher magnification. So we're going to take a look at this part of the brain right here. So here's a cross section of the human cortex, which you guys, you've talked about a bit already, right? So, and so here is where the gray matter is, where the neurons are. Here's where the white matter is, where they're sending all their projections. It turns out that in the cerebral cortex, there are groups of neurons. This is obviously drawn way out of scale. That all have roughly the same orientation. OK? So they have polarity. So that means when they fire, that there is relative negativity and positivity that's oriented in the same way for large groups of neurons. So that when we're seeing changes in potential, with the, the scalp EEG, it represents groups of neurons that are firing roughly at the same time. OK? So key concept here, I don't want you to think that this represents the activity of a single cell. We're going to come back to that in a sec. OK? Everybody with me? All right. Now, here's what, here's what the shocker was, is they said to the, the, the people who were using the EEG said, this is extremely cool. We now have a method of being able to actually measure in vivo, while alive, the activity of the human brain. And here's what they observed normally. Well, you can bet one of the first things they wanted to do was measure the activity in people who are having epilepsy, because the presumption was that there was something going on elect that was electrically abnormal in the brain, but no one really knew what it was. And lo and behold, when they did this, and this was, I think, within a matter of a year or two of demonstrating the EEG in humans for this first time, in a, in a different patient, well, let's just do a different recording. While the patient was having a seizure, 
they saw this. And then seizure end. Okay? Dramatically different behavior. Now, what could this represent? What do you think that this represents? It's exactly, you heard that? They're all firing together. Exactly right. This must represent large groups of neurons that are hyper excitable and hyper synchronized. Okay? So, important learning point, everyone. When you think about what's going on during a seizure, the definition of a seizure is an electrical event that is, has a sudden onset and is characterized by hyperexcitability and hypersynchronization of large groups of neurons. That's it. Well, we, let's test this out a little bit more. Let's find out if it's, that's really true because this is based on a recording some distance away. Okay? So, as new techniques were developed for measuring in a more sophisticated way, the electrical activity in the cortex, people were able to do the kinds of experiments that I think we want to do right now, okay? Which is, let's take, we'll have to do this in an animal model, although in the surgical suite we could do this with humans. Um, let's actually take an electrode and place it directly into the cortex and see what happens, okay? So, in this case then, we'll take an electrode and we'll place it right here, okay? And here's the recording tip. And remember, there's lots more neurons here than I've drawn. Okay, and here's the tip. And now, now what we can do is we can induce a seizure in an animal model or record it in a human in the operating room and see what we measure in our, in our oscilloscope. And actually, if you don't mind, I'm just going to take the EEG away and now go to the extracellular recording. So we're going to have the same readout, okay? But the scale of everything's all different now. This is, not, this is no longer from the scalp. This electrode is sensing what's going on in the midst of the seizure, and here's what it shows. Time scale's a little bit different, okay? Now, this is, is this consistent with what we're thinking about going on in terms of groups of neurons? Absolutely yes. This is called an extracellular, outside of the cell, field potential. In other words, it's sensing the, the electrical change in a field. It's actually a sphere. And it's summating the activity of all whatever neurons are sufficiently sensed by this electrode tip is what's represented by this electrical change. And so again, this is not a single neuron firing. It's whatever group of neurons are close enough to this extracellular electrode um, to fire and be sensed. Okay? So this is consistent with our hypothesis, right? That during a seizure, there is hyperexcitability because, oh, by the way, I should show you what this is doing normally. If this were in another region of the cortex, another tracing, it would basically be looking like this. Not that inconsistent with the EEG. So this represents hyperexcitability, and this represents hypersynchronization, groups of neurons firing at the same time. Okay? Great. You want to do any other experiments? I love you. That's fantastic. Exactly. Why not? I mean, if we've now, we've now got an extracellular field potential, let's see what's going on in an individual neuron. Okay. Now, this took a little bit more time to develop because it's one thing to be able to poke an electrode into tissue and get an extracellular recording. It's something else to actually make an electrode fine enough uh, and, and uh, persistent enough that you can record from individual neurons. But that's been going on for a long time now. So we're going to now poke an electrode directly into one of these cells, like so. Okay? And again, we can use the same oscilloscope. Nowadays, it's a computer screen. The time scale is going to be quite different this time. Um, and we're going to look at the activity of this cell in the midst of a seizure that we're recording, say, with the EEG. So we're, going to, we're sure that it's within the seizure focus. And this was an observation that was made in the late 1950s. It's actually almost exactly 50 years ago now that this was reported. And here's what it was observed. The cell was sitting there at rest, and it suddenly depolarized, had a whole bunch of spikes, and then went down like this, hyperpolarized, and came back to normal. Now, have you guys talked about the action potential? Okay. Okay, we need to understand this. So, um, I'm going to come to a neuron uh, in, a, in a few minutes, but let me draw it in advance. 
OK, so here's uh, your generic neuron with its nucleus and some of its processes. And w w why, what's the job of a neuron? Commun exactly. The nature, nature designed this cell to be the ultimate communicator. Okay? So it's a signaling machine. That's its job. Very different than, say, a liver cell, right? Or a skin. I mean, e each one has its own thing. Neurons are designed to signal. And the, the, their, their shape is what allows them to collect together signals and to send them long distances. We're going to come back to this in a few minutes. But the actual signal itself, of course, we've said, is electrical signals. And what the neuron does is when it is ready to send a signal to another neuron in the network, it fires off an action potential. And it happens, this is called the axon. This is the cell body, or the soma of the cell. And this axon is what allows it to send a signal to another cell. So the signal itself is called an action potential, and it looks something like this. And this thing propagates along the axon. And the, the biology of the formation of an action potential and its ability to move long distances has got to be one of the most beautiful things I've ever studied. I'm a little biased, what can I say? Um, but but these, these action potentials are sent off in trains. And the, the frequency of their arrival at the end of this axon is what allows signaling to occur. And Alan talked last week, I'm sure, about the way pain is propagated by signals traveling along um, neurons. That's what happens. So these things, these spikes that I'm, I'm drawing here, are individual action potentials. Okay? And so what we're seeing here is a depolarization. The cell's getting excitable. And it reaches a certain point where it fires off a train of action potentials. And then it's done. And then it becomes a little bit less sensitive to depolarization. That's this part here. And then it comes back to rest. And I won't go into the details of, of, of what's going on biochemically, except to say that when cells are, are excitable, they're usually responding to what we call excitatory neurotransmitters, or chemicals in our brain, which when they touch or when they land on a receptor, open up channels that allow ions to flow in the cell, and the cell then becomes more excitable. Excitatory neurotransmitters. And this aspect of the cell, of firing off a train of action potentials, is due to the, the release of these excitatory neurotransmitters. Is that fairly clear? OK, I think I see enough yes nodding to be happy. OK, all right, well, there you go. You now know precisely what is happening in the brain of a person who's having a seizure. I, you know, I study this for a living, and I can't take you much further than this. It's as simple as that. Normally when, you know, sitting here, most of you look like you're presumably uh, uh, listening, which I always appreciate. Every once in a while I find a student who's in coma, so I don't know, exa I don't know exactly what their brain's doing. But at the moment, I'm, while I'm talking and while you're listening, our cortex, the neurons are firing away at their basal type of pattern, somewhat chaotic if we measured it from a distance, but making sense. But they're not firing off these rapid bursts of action potentials neuron by neuron. And just as importantly, they're not in large networks of cells doing that same kind of hyperexcitable activity at the same time or hypersynchronized. Okay? That that's what is going on. N now the next in the next section of the discussion, I'd like to explore with you what the basis is of the different seizure types. Because at the moment, most of you, this is, this is my job, I'm, I'm going to teach you, that there are many different types of seizures. Okay? We saw one example at the beginning of the lecture. We're going to see a whole number of others. Okay? So to explore this, now that you've mastered the, an understanding of what's going on in the brain of a person while they're having a seizure, we're going to do a thought experiment. And, and it's the following. And it's related to the question that you just raised. It's great. These guys are they're tough, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so so what, the, the thought experiment is this. Now let's make a device that does this. Okay, we can hold it anywhere we want on the scalp, and it will induce hyperexcitability and hypersynchronization in a relatively small area on the cortex. Okay, actually, an ex a device like that uh, has, exists now. But this one's really cool. It's it's got it's got an area about this big, and 
uh, through the scalp onto the overlying cerebral cortex, it will create a group of neurons to suddenly start, it, the group of neurons will suddenly start firing together, okay? So let's do the experiment. So, so here's the first, uh, let's, let's place it right on the brain on the left side, on the brain on the left side, sort of in the frontal lobe, um, in the area that we use to move our, use our muscles, okay? So I'm placing it right about here frontal lobe, left side. Turn it on, seizure is now occurring in my brain, left cerebral cortex, frontal lobe. What's the seizure look like? Movement of my right hand, exactly right. So here it goes and here's the, here's the movement. It turns out to be repetitive rhythmic movements because of the nature of these networks and it's in the contralateral side, opposite side to where the seizure is because of the crossing of the fibers, exactly right. Um, uh, you've heard about the homunculus, some of you have. The homunculus is the map of the brain. So it turns out that there are regions that supply the arm and the leg in a different place in the face. And if you have something firing away in the region of the hand, it actually might affect the face as well. So the patient may actually have... That's the seizure. Now, is, is consciousness affected? Is consciousness or awareness affected? Why? Why? Or I should say why not, right? No, it, it, actually consciousness does not be, need to be affected at all. Uh, just to make the point, you've met people who are paralyzed in one limb and are otherwise completely, totally normal in terms of their brain function which says that a focal area of the brain that controls motor movement doesn't necessarily have to impair any of the other components of conscious, of, of, of the brain, okay? And this is, imp is imp I wouldn't have expected you to necessarily know the answer, by the way, because the localization of awareness and consciousness is, 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 is not s simple and straightforward. But I'll tell you that you can have a focal seizure in one discrete part of the brain without affecting consciousness. This is an important concept because it helps us actually create the classification system. So this first type of seizure that we've just done with this thought experiment, I'm going to put in a category known as focal seizures. I, I need to throw in the next word, unfortunately. It's going to be very confusing. But it's also commonly referred to as partial but I really don't like this word because it makes people think that it's like only half a seizure or part of a seizure. Not true. This is a full seizure. It's a complete seizure, not a partial seizure. But the key thing is, in this experiment we've just done, it's a focal one. We're only restricting the seizure activity to one part of the brain, okay? So it's focal, and since consciousness is not involved, we're gonna subcategorize it further, and we're gonna call it focal and simple. Now that's as opposed to complex, which we'll get to in a second, but simple refers to the fact that consciousness is not impaired during this event. And it's, there's even another categorization, and that is we're going to call this a motor seizure. Okay? Focal, because the seizure is constrained to one region of the cortex. Simple, because consciousness is not at all involved. As this seizure is going on, Although I might have some problems speaking during it, I, I'm fully aware and I can talk to you. Uh, and it's motor because that's the manifestation. Okay? Now, let's move the seizure generator back two or three centimeters, and now we're in the parietal lobe. What do you think the seizure's like now? Anyone remember what the parietal lobe does as opposed to? Well, th that's going to be in another area. So sensation, I think I heard somebody say. So the parietal lobe has to do with sensation. So uh, uh, when we pick up signals from the outside world along the surface of our skin, for example, we actually ultimately sense that in the parietal lobe, okay? So during, so here we go, starting the seizure, and here we go, I can sense it. It's, uh, it's happening, yep, it's, it's just what it always feels like. It's sort of migrating up my hand. I can feel it in my face a little bit too. Um, this is what they, it always feels like. I can't really describe what, I don't have words to describe exactly what this feels like, 
Why? Because this is not the no type of normal activity that your cortex has. So we, the words we use for it feels kind of light or soft or cold or tingly or whatever, these are words that we derive because we all can have the same experience. But the seizure that I'm having is abnormal activity that is unique to me and all I can say is it feels really weird and different. And uh, there it goes, it's gone away. So um, is this a focal seizure? Yes. Is it a simple seizure? Yes. Consciousness doesn't need to be impaired. Um, and instead of being a motor seizure, we'll call it a sensory seizure. Okay? So there's a number of other details in this classification system at, at this section, but I'm not, going to, I'm not going to include it. Oh, here's what I want. Okay, now um, let's move the seizure generator to a different spot. Let's, uh, let's put it in the temporal lobe, left temporal lobe. So what's the temporal lobe do, especially the left temporal lobe? Emotions sit there. Yeah, the amygdala is a, this almond shaped structure is in the deep temporal lobe that we know has to do with fear and, and emotions. Language, especially if it's left, most, most, most of us have our language sitting in the left hemisphere. It's not everybody, but most. So, so our ability to understand um, uh, things that are, people are saying or to be able to form words and, and to produce language is sitting there. Anything else? So there's, some, there's this, this structure called the hippocampus. Exactly, good. So the hippocampus is uh, this sea, uh, seahorse shaped, hence hippocampus, seahorse shaped structure that is absolutely critical for memory function. And it sits on both temporal lobes, but when one's affected your memory. Now putting all that together, the seizure that may occur is going to be a bit more curious. So. And that's what a seizure emanating from the temporal lobe might be, be like. I was unable to communicate because language is affected. I didn't show much emotion in this one, but I can tell you that we've measured many examples of seizures emanating from the temporal lobe in which the emotions are incredible, actually, that, that are emitted by the person during the seizure. Um, and my memory was probably not completely normal during that. I couldn't process the events that we're all processing right now second by second. So was consciousness impaired? Yes. Not only because of the language, by the way. A person can lose language and may still be quite aware of things. But if you throw in the emotional, the changes in emotional processing plus language abnormalities plus the inability to sort of take in information second by second that, that memory systems allow us to do, Consciousness is, is abnormal, okay? So that's, is it a focal seizure? Yes, we, occur, we, we made it occur in one discrete region. Is it simple? No, consciousness was impaired, so we're gonna call it complex. And the subtype, at least the one we just created, we would call, we could call it a temporal lobe seizure. Okay, an example, uh, one example. Now the frontal, the front part of the human brain is also where a lot of rather complicated activity takes place. Um, social cognition, uh, 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 higher order processing and so forth. And that would be another example of a complex seizure emanating from the frontal lobe, okay? Great, perfect. So if there are focal seizures, there must be more generalized seizures, okay? So uh, let's think about that for a second. Now, he, this is where I'm gonna throw you a curveball, and this actually confuses the medical students a lot as well, because I've kind of built the whole story up until this point by, by leading you along and saying that we can just create these seizures occurring in one place, and it's, you know, you guys have all clearly got it. It turns out that the brain is quite capable of having a seizure everywhere at once. Actually, I should throw in, 
every single person's brain in this room is capable of having a seizure all at once under the right or wrong circumstances. Um, if you injected me with a drug that blocked all the inhibitory neurotransmitter in our, not all, but some of that, the inhibitory neurotransmitter in my brain, I would have uh, uh, one wicked seizure. I, I would have, uh, any of us would have a big giant seizure all at once, okay? And so what I need you to think of is could it, are there circumstances where the brain is in a situation where anything could just touch it into a point where essentially the entire cortex is having a seizure all at once, okay? And it turns out to be true, it, it can happen. And, and, and um, we don't completely understand why that occurs, but part of it has to do with the connections between deep structures in the brain and the cortex. You've all heard of the thalamus. It's a deep structure way down in the center that has to do with maintaining our awareness. It has lots of connections from the central core to the cerebral cortex on both sides. And it turns out that that's probably one of the networks that allows a seizure to suddenly spread over both sides of the brain all at once, okay? So um, there's a couple of different types of generalized seizures that I'd like to describe. And here's where the real curveball comes, okay? There's one form that is, is particularly seen in young children and school-age children. And they're, they're, they're described, the children are described by people who don't recognize it initially as kids who seem to drift off and daydream and then sort of suddenly come back to it, okay? And these, these, um, these may occur multiple times per day. It's relatively, it's actually common among kids, but it's a relatively uncommon. So the, per, the, the child may be sitting at the school desk or even standing up, and so they, they could be having a conversation, and uh, they'll be able to try to maintain the, what they're trying to say, but it, it's as though things are just being in, interrupted by whatever the seizures are. Okay? I mean, I like to think of this as, you know, in the, in the old VH, VHS tape days um, <laughs> as being, you know, the, the tape's getting hung up in the sprocket and, the, and it's constantly catching up again. Um, and that's what the experience is of these children. You can imagine how difficult it is for them to learn anything when they're constantly catching up with the last couple of seconds. Now, usually it doesn't occur hundreds of times a day, but it may occur many times a day. And, um, uh, the, the interesting thing is that when they did EEGs on these patients, go back over here. They saw something really, really amazing, and that is that during, here's the background activity of the child, and suddenly it did and so forth. And this time period actually was one second, okay? So they have an EEG abnormality that is described as three per second spike end wave. And I, I don't want to go into too much detail about this, but that is what happens in this particular type of seizure. Some of you have probably heard of it, and I, I have to include it on the list because it's, it's part of the classification. And we call these absence seizures, absence, absent, also known as petit mal. And every, I can hear some people say, oh yeah, right, if lots, lots of people have heard petit mal. Right, so a petit mal seizure or absence seizure characteristically occurs in school-age kids. They have these brief periods, and this is what's happening in their brain at the time. Okay, is it a generalized seizure? Yes, because you can measure the three per second spike in wave over virtually all the cortex at the same time. But you still know what's happening in terms of the individual neurons. It's the same thing as we uh, saw before. Okay? So what else? Well, um, of course, imagine if we could create the same kind of seizure activity as we did with the seizure generator on the, in that motor strip, but we were able to create that all over the cortex all at the same time. So instead of, instead of this three per second spike in wave, we're back to the high frequency bursting.
okay, all over the brain at the same time. Now, this uh, may come on with or without some warning, depending on the nature of the seizure. If the person is in the midst of inspiration and suddenly the seizure occurs, now let's think about this, the, both sides of the brain firing all at the same time, both sides. So there's now going to be sudden contraction of muscles, both sides at the same time. And if the person's in inspiration, the glottis may close down, the diaphragm um, may uh, uh, change, the person may actually expire in terms of breathing out air. So, And that's what a generalized tonic-clonic seizure might look like. Now, I didn't fall to the ground as I would, as a patient would, because of course I had no control over my musculature, so I couldn't stand up. So those patients will fall to the ground if they're already not lying down. But again, if you just picture the idea that virtually all the cortex is having this very high frequency spiking all at the same time, is consciousness involved? Definitely, the person actually becomes essentially comatose. They're not aware of the outside world. Their whole brain is not working properly. Um, because, because antagonistic muscles are being contracted initially at the same time, meaning muscles that both flex and extend the arm are contracting at the same time. Well, that's why you get that posturing, okay? And then once the inhibition starts coming back, you get the release and then contraction again. That's the first part is called the tonic phase, tonic or ongoing tone or contraction. Then clonic, the word refers to the interruptions. Tonic first, then clonic, and then the person is really hyper inhibited at the end of the seizure, hence the coma that persists after the seizure is done, and the sort of the slow breathing and so forth, okay? Yes? you are breathing through this. So actually, during the initial phase, during the tonic phase, no. But fortunately, these seizures are generally quite, are short enough so that you're not having respiratory compromise. But I, so I, I actually take back my first answer. During the first phase, you're not breathing. But it, it doesn't, it, it, as long as a person doesn't have any problems with their airway, it does, uh, in terms of aspiration, it's not a problem. Okay? All right, so uh, the second type of seizure then is called a tonic clonic seizure. Okay, and there are other subtypes. There are pure tonic seizures, there are clonic seizures, there are myoclonic seizures and others, but this is the basics. Okay, is everyone clear? Okay, you guys have got it. I mean, there's not a lot more to say about this part of the talk either. You, this is the classification system that we use. And when patients come in and describe what first is a seizure, you know, our, our job as ep epilepsy doctors are, is, to, is to try to say, okay, there's a whole bunch of different types of seizures. You know, what kind is this? And we, we listen to the person or the, the family member or someone who's seen the seizure, and we try to place this in the classification system. Um, there's one other, there's one uh, a third uh, part that is particularly important. It's Roman numeral three, but this is, this one's in, this is a slam dunk. You're gonna get this right away. And that is that you can have seizures that start focally, but quickly generalize over the entire brain, okay? It shouldn't be hard to put those two together, right? Because I just described people who have a propensity for the entire brain seizing, and we've talked all about people who might have just a focus, and there are people who have both. I really emphasize this with the medical students because we call this focal with secondary generalization. And the reason why this is important, and I'll, I'll, I'd, I'd love for you to understand this as well, is when we get to some of the causes of epilepsy, I'm sure you can appreciate already that the things that cause a focal seizure might be quite different 
than the things that cause a generalized seizure. But when we see a patient who has a generalized seizure that started focally, we have to think about those focal causes. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Really important. So if you ever get in a situation where you see someone have a seizure, take note if you saw the onset. Say to yourself, oh, you know what? I noticed that he first had this kind of blank stare and started shaking his right arm and then fell to the ground. That's a very important observation because that's to be distinguished from the person who you observe suddenly collapse onto the ground and have bilateral, you know, both sides of the body move, movements because that helps us in terms of characterizing what, what the nature of the seizure might be. Okay? Uh, good. Let's see. Let's, let's, we're going to show some slides here. Okay, so I thought it would be worthwhile to uh, see some real EEGs. So uh, here you go. Now that you're um, experts, um, almost board certified at electroencephalographers. <laughs> so here's what, here's what the EEG uh, kind of looks like. We put electrodes on many different parts of the scalp in predetermined locations, and then we make comparisons between pairs. And this, this shows you some of the readings that you can see in a normal EEG. But what I, was really, what I really wanted to show you is what a true EEG looks like. So this is a eight-channel EEG, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And, and these, these are going over this chain of electrodes and this chain of electrodes. So it's on the left side of the brain across here and on the right side. And so the first, the first set of waveforms is measuring activity between this frontal electrode and the one just behind it. Then the next line is measuring between this one and this one, and so forth. And this is the way then we're looking at activity on the left side of the brain on the top and the right side on the bottom. And there's a lot to be confused about in this picture because there's all kinds of artifacts. You might think that this is actually a seizure. It's an artifact. Um, you see this kind of buildup of waveforms. It's actually normal. It's seen in the back part of the brain. But this is what an EEG looks like. But I, the main thing is to kind of appreciate the general gestalt of this normal EEG. And we'll look at a couple of others that are actually pathological. So for example, you can see here, right, that now you're seeing these really kind of high amplitude, um, not very frequent, but high amplitude. These are spikes. So these are groups of neurons that are firing roughly at the same time. And their location, where, where, where is this located? At the top, at the vertex, that's right. It's, a, it's a, between channels like three and four. So that's giving you a sense of what a spike looks like. How about this one? You see, you see some patterns in this one? How about along here? Right, look at this. Spike, wave, spike, wave, spike, wave, spike, wave. Three per second. This is a person who's having an absence or a petit mal seizure. How about this one? Anything abnormal in this? Come on, don't let me down. You know, almost board certified. <laughs> Anything abnormal in this one? That is a, that's what we call, it's, it's a spike. And in fact, this spike is actually being generated at the electrode that is common to row two and three. So it's actually, here's two, here's three. It's, the, it's this electrode that seems to be the source of this spike. Okay? This is actually an interictal spike, meaning between seizures. This is just a person who actually happens to have repeated seizures, but he's not having one now. But, but so he's otherwise awake and normal and lying there having the EEG. But this is a signature of a tendency towards hyperexcitability. And we use these interictal EEGs to try to support or deny the diagnosis of epilepsy in people. Because we can't always get a seizure, um, ca a capture a seizure when a person comes in for an EEG. So this is a, a, an interictal spike. And of course, you know exactly what's going on in the neurons that give rise to that. And then uh, here's, here's a seizure developing. Sorry, it's a little bit small. But you can see sort of this buildup of activity, building up, building up. And then it spreads across a couple of electrodes. And then it abruptly stops. This is a focal seizure that's limited to one side of the brain. OK? So uh, I'd, I'd now like to show you a, a series of real seizures. These are tapes taken from various educational uh, videos um, to uh, just make sure you see a realistic uh, 
version of some of the seizures that I tried to demonstrate. So here's the first one. Here's, here's a, uh, a focal seizure. So this is a little infant and you can see the left leg is having intermittent, what we would call clonic activity. You can see that the right leg moves normally. So you've got complete control there, but the left leg is interrupted by these occasional movements. A little bit of the foot. See the little movements there? Okay, and, and in fact, I'll show you the beginning just one more time. Go back. See that? That's a focal seizure. Okay, now, um, in the partial complex seizures, like the temporal lobe seizures, what I demonstrated were these kind of, I had some chewing movements and I was sort of fumbling around with my hand. These things are called automatisms, sort of basal automatic movements. I can't completely uh, understand why they occur, but they, they seem to represent very rudimentary behavioral responses to whatever is going on in that area of the brain. Actually, I should back up one more second. I, I failed to, to, to mention that a number of patients who have focal seizures, especially when they're arising from these more complex areas, have, have what's called a, a warning. They know that a seizure is coming on. And that's actually, that's actually called the aura. Aura. That everyone knows what that is. Aura actually is, is, it comes from the Greek word breeze, which is very apt. So it's as though it's the, it's the breeze before the storm. And patients will describe very, very unusual um, characteristics, like um, un, uh, very odd odors, like the smell of burnt rubber or gasoline or other things that are, are strange. Or they may notice that they just feel different. There's something different, and it's very stereotypic. I have a patient who, whenever she gets her complex partial seizure, the warning is that her, it feels as though her body is lifting upward. She calls it the whooshes. And the best that I can get to is that it's that feeling when you're going down an elevator more quickly than you expected and you get that lifting sensation. That's what it feels, apparently feels like for her every time. Now, these are actually seizures. They're not pre-seizures, but they're, but they're the, they're a simple seizure that in which the consciousness hasn't been impaired. It's just an internal sensation that then evolves into the more complex one. But anyway, here's what automatisms look like. So here's a child. He's now turning a little bit to the right. You can see some what we call lip smacking movements in his mouth. He's just staring off. Seems to be interested in the right side of the world. It may be a manifestation. I'd suspect a seizure may be coming from the left. And now it's kind of over, and she's back to it. Looks a little confused. Now, may, this may still be part of the seizure, actually. Probably is. And now it's done. OK? So that was a. Uh, partial complex seizure emphasizing automatisms. Here's a, a, a more modern example. And that he has purposeless movements of one hand as well as some swallowing automatisms. And uh, this all goes on for about a minute and a, a minute and a half. So the patient, again, he's sort of staring off. The seizure started a couple seconds ago. His right hand is postured upward. You see how it's a little bit flexed? That's a clue that the seizure is probably coming from the left side. Um, but it's not really a motor, it's certainly not a simple motor seizure because he's not normal. He's not communicating with his wife, and actually she comes over now, I think. Kevin? Mm. Can you hear me? Hmm? Mm. So he's okay? fiance tries to. He's speak aware to him, that his wife is there, but partly, but clearly isn't responding. Can you hear me? Mm. So that Most people, the left hemisphere Kevin? is dominant for speech, Kevin. and as a consequence, uh, this marked Kevin. difficulty he has in speaking and also me? a difficulty me? that... Okay, and so that, that's an example of another partial complex seizure. Here's an absence seizure. Seizures may sometimes be precipitated by having the patient hyperventilate. The so, so the patient's hyperventilating, that can actually bring on seizures, and if you look at the EEG uh, in the lower left-hand corner, you can see it actually change 
to a three per second spike in weight. There it goes. And the patient is, is actually not aware at the moment. Well, He'll come back just as though nothing And the happened. nurse is going to ask him a question to Did repeat something. Did you hear me say something. anything else? No. Okay. Did you hear me say something, but you cannot remember it? Yeah. Let's take one more look at this. Okay, watch the EEG. So it's normal background right now. Subtle loss of consciousness, the period of complete blackout, and then the prompt return to responsiveness. And now the EEG is going to change right about now. See it? Two, Suddenly become a waveform. Two, three. So yeah. he's in the middle of, and now it stops. Something? Now he's come back. So that's, that's what an absence seizure looks like. Now, here's an example of a tonic seizure. Here this see a this, tonic this poor little guy uh, really looks unhappy. I mean, his seizures really just uh, are characterized by sudden extension of the upper extremities. And this is happening thousands of times a day. There it is. Uh -huh. That one is associ oftentimes associated with other brain diseases, but it's called a tonic seizure. Now, now, the next form is called an atonic seizure. That'd be the, ap the opposite of tonic. So it's going to be flaccidity. Okay, so sudden loss of all muscle tone. It's relatively unusual. It's usually seen in people with, with other, brain, other brain abnormalities. These patients are usually severely mentally retarded because they have sudden loss of tone without warning, they can fall to the ground and hit their head. So they're the patients who often require wearing a, um, a football helmet of some sort. And I should just warn you a little bit, this, this film, this particular clip is, can be hard to look at. These patients are, are um, pretty devastated by this. So here's, here's a, it's an institutionalized patient and suddenly falls. This, of course, is an atonic seizure. Okay. And very suddenly. Here's an example of someone who's in an activity and the seizure begins right about now. Okay, so complete sudden loss of tone and then the seizure um, uh, is over. And then uh, just to be a, a little bit more complete, I didn't emphasize this, but there are these things called myoclonic seizures, which are sudden contractions. It's kind of like the tonic seizure that I showed you before, oftentimes seen in, in little newborns. And again, uh, uh, often a manifestation of, of a more general brain disease. I'll show you that one more time. And finally, here's focal with secondary generalization. So here's the same patient you saw before with a complex partial seizure. And it's his behavior right now is not too dissimilar to when he was sitting there in the kitchen. But it's the, the, the focus, which I think is on the left side, is starting to spread, spreading over more of the left hemisphere, and eventually goes over both sides of the brain, and it's transitioning into a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. A typical tonic phase of the attack with his arms now you can stiffly see. extended, and the same is commonly true of the legs at the same time. This lasts perhaps 10 to 15, 20 seconds, and then begins to slow progressively into the clonic phase of the seizure. Again, this gets slower and slower, and then after about another 15 to 30 seconds, we'll stop. During this part of the attack, the patient may bite his tongue, may have incontinence, and will often salivate. Does the fact that he has both complex partial... Okay, so focal with secondary generalization. Okay, now I, let's, let's conclude by just talking a little bit about causes and then treatment and then questions. Okay, so uh, I've sort of already led you a bit by saying that the importance of focal, recognizing focal seizures because it can signify an underlying focal abnormality of the brain. Okay, given that, you can, you can generate the differential diagnostic list just as well as I can. You know, what are the kinds of things that might lead to abnorm an abnormal focus or an abnormal region of the brain. Did you say trauma? I'm sorry, is that what you said? 
Oh, tumor. Okay, but uh, good. You get you get two points. You get both of them. Um, okay, so this is this is going to be an incomplete list, but it's just to emphasize the many different. There are, there are actually many many uh, dozens, if not a hundred or more causes of of, of uh, uh, seizures in people. Um, but brain tumor. Um, I should say that for most of the things that we list here, we don't understand the precise reason why it, it leads to the hyperexcitability of the neurons that we, now, we all understand well. I mean, we all get that. But if you then ask me why does a tumor cause that hypersynchronized behavior, I can honestly tell you, and again, I study this for my living, I, we absolutely do not know. It's, 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 it's almost, it's, it is embarrassing to say that. But we do not understand why a group of neurons in the region of a tumor become hy hypersynchronized. But we certainly know that tumors can cause it. So that's one. Um, trauma. So significant brain trauma, not just a minor concussion, but certainly penetrating head trauma, such as in a, in a, uh, a bullet injury or motor vehicle accident in, in which the, uh, the cranium is, is actually uh, fractured and there's direct impingement on the tissue of the brain um, is a very common uh, and frequent cause of um, seizure activity in people. Again, we don't completely understand the reason, although there's some suggestive uh, things. I won't go into it. I was going to draw some neural networks, but we don't really have time. I want to leave sufficient time for questions. But the general idea is that in certain forms of physical injury, of traumatic injury to the brain, that there's a a more of a susceptibility to the neurons that drive the inhibition of the brain to the excitation. So if you can imagine groups of neurons that, sit, that create this fine balance that allows us to do what we do with our brain, a, a balance between excitation and inhibition, and if the brain injury selectively knocks out that inhibitory side, then excitation will prevail, and that can be a cause of a seizure. Okay? Other other reasons? Yes. Severe headaches. Pain. Um, I don't. I don't know if I. I don't think that. Okay. Yeah. Um, there is this inter <laughs> There is an interesting overlap between migraine pe migraineurs, people with migraine, and people with epilepsy. So we do think that there can be some commonality. But at least I would say people who have severe pain in a seizure, the stress of the pain is making a change in the neurochemistry that, that can lead to a seizure. But I'd be concerned that they have another underlying cause for their seizure. Any other things? Dr OK, great, great. All these are perfect. Um, drugs. Uh, absolutely. And we already talked about the fact that if you infused a particular kind of drug, you can induce a seizure. Well, it turns out that. Penicillin, intravenous penicillin, lowers the seizure threshold a little bit. And there are a whole, ho this is not to say you should avoid taking penicillin. It's just that drugs, many different medicinal drugs and many illicit drugs, including especially things like cocaine, ecstasy, even alcohol in excess or especially after a binge during withdrawal, changes the neurochemical properties of the brain, very common causes of seizures and epilepsy. Um, someone said fever, great. So it turns out that fever in little kids is a cause of seizures, but usually isn't a dangerous thing in terms of developing a lifetime of seizures. Uh, the, the, the maturing infant brain seems to have a susceptibility to increased hypersynchronization and excitability um, during a high fever. Anyone in here ha ever have a child who, age one, two, three, de developed a seizure in the setting of a fever? Huh? Your brother? Yeah. It, uh, uh, really common. Really common, actually. Um, yes? The question was whether blinking lights can induce seizures in patients. Yes. So there are a subgroup of patients who, um, with the right, again, or wrong type of frequency of visual stimulation, can have a seizure. And that's because they, have, they usually have an underlying reason. But then when their brain starts getting hypersynchronized by an external stimulus, it pushes them over into a seizure. And for example, I, I saw a patient in the emergency room a couple of years ago who came in with his first time seizure as a 55-year-old. And the seizure began while he was commuting back to Marin um, 
uh, uh, going over the Golden Gate Bridge. And the, sun, the setting sun was interrupted by the vertical cables and drove, the, drove his brain. And because he had an underlying tumor, that was enough to begin the first seizure. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of unusual stimuli that can actually. I, I've seen patients who can induce their seizures by doing mental arithmetic. Well, no, they try to avoid it. But, 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 but it's very, very rare. It's extremely rare, but it's been reported for decades. And, uh, but again, not that curious because when you do certain activities with your brain, you may be driving small networks in a certain way that it's just enough to induce a seizure. Yeah. Yes. More often, alcohol induces seizures during the withdrawal phase. So um, and I've seen people who have their seizures while they're drinking, but more often than not, it's as they're coming off. So, and I don't know the connection with an abuse. Yes. Yes. Very good. So, so um, meningitis and encephalitis, infections with bacteria or viruses, are very important causes of seizures. Again, don't know the exact reason. Probably due to the actual destruction of certain groups of neurons by the pathogen. Yes, you had. Okay, good. Um, heart attack can be a cause of stroke, but stroke I'm going to put on the list. So you can imagine if there is a part of the brain that has been damaged by the loss of blood flow that it, it represents a stroke, that that region can be the source of a seizure. And in fact, stroke is arguably the most common cause of seizures in people after age 60 or so. Fatigue. Ah, you know, I'm not going to put that on the list of actual causes, but I'm going to I'm going to call it a precipitant. And I'm really glad you mentioned this because, um, and I'm going to get in a second to the, the the approach to treating patients. But many people with epilepsy of of whatever cause will say that one of the ways that they're at increased risk of having a seizure is if they become sleep deprived. And I'd say among the college students that I treat in the epilepsy center, the most typical story I'm getting is that they've been doing fine, taking their medications, everything was good, and then exam time came around and they became sleep deprived. And we think, we think that sleep deprivation induces seizures because the, the synchronous, synchronicity of the brain gets altered in different amounts of fatigue or sleep deprivation. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that one down here. Many other diseases <laughs> because the list is, is incredibly long. Degenerative diseases of the brain, of which Alzheimer's is one, is also an extremely common cause in the elderly for seizures. Um, and as you could see from some of the videotapes, uh, epilepsy, recurrent seizures, is admixed with other neurologic diseases often. So for example, those institutionalized kids, they, uh, uh, they, they could have had all kinds of metabolic disorders of the brain and, and other developmental anomalies and so forth. Let, just because of time, I'm going to put the last one up, um, unless anyone wanted to say heredity. Hey, all right. <laughs> Yeah, all roads lead back to Hippocrates, right? So, so heredity is really, really important. There are relatively rare families in which you can trace this, the epilepsy through multiple generations. And um, I, I was emphasizing up until now how little we know about the causes of seizures and epilepsy. Well, this is, this is one of our great successes in the, in the world of epilepsy research in the last uh, 15 years, and that is we've discovered a number of mutations that are the cause of epilepsy in these families. Um, uh, and not surprisingly, many of them appear to be mutations in the proteins that regulate the electrical activity at the surface of the neuron. And, you know, not surprisingly now, but, but we didn't know leading up until, to it. What the, what the real um, horizon of epilepsy research is right now, a real hot area, is trying to understand the more subtle hereditary effects that we know exist, where we think multiple genes might be working at the same time to just lower the seizure threshold enough to cause epilepsy in people. OK, so I'm going to call it there and just talk briefly now about uh, the approach to treatment.
the first thing is identify the underlying cause. So for example, if a person has been doing cocaine every time they're having a seizure, the appropriate thing is counseling and make sure they might possibly see the connection between doing cocaine and having a seizure. Um, if the person has a abnormality of their electrolytes and that's the cause of the seizure, we try to correct the underlying. If the person has an infection, we treat the infection. If they have a fever, we try to lower the fever. So those are ways of treating the underlying cause. Secondly is to try to identify precipitants. Sorry, avoid precipitants. So there are occasional patients who will only have their seizures under certain circumstances, like the college student who gets sleep deprived. Well, if they're really rare and that's the only time they've occurred, then the approach to treatment is behavior modification. And I tell, my pa I tell these patients, listen, it's real straightforward. It's not going to be easy to do as a college student because it's fun to stay up late, but this is the most holistic approach you could take. You simply need to restructure your sleep hygiene, if you will. And you need to get a minimum of seven hours of sleep each night. And if you do that, you won't have a seizure. And I would I any one of us would prefer that to any of the other approaches to treatment that I'm about to list. Um, the third is the use of anti-seizure medications. And you've heard, um, many of you have heard about these, drugs like phenytone or dilantin or carbamazepine or tegretol or Keppra, levetiracetam, lamictal, lamotrigine, on and on. In the last 10 years, there's been a big increase in the number of drugs that we can use. Um, uh, the good news is many of them are extremely effective at stopping seizure activity. They work directly on the neurons. They've saved, literally saved the lives of people, many of millions of people with epilepsy. The bad news is most of the time they have some measurable side effect. And this is the real, I think, sad part. Uh, and certainly anyone in the room here who knows about living with epilepsy knows this. The sad part is that these drugs, they work on the brain overall. And when the person's not having a seizure, a significant number of patients will notice that the drug is having some effect. Not everybody. I've got plenty of patients who are perfectly functional taking these medications and they don't get their seizures, but many of them do have side effects. Um, and the fourth is surgery. So there are a certain number of patients, it's actually about 30%, who prove to be refractory to medications. They, they don't have their seizures controlled by taking medications or even combinations of multiple medications. And in a selected group of those patients, we can identify where the seizure focus is and the surgeon can go in and actually resect the seizure focus. Uh, and in properly selected patients, this may be effective in, uh, at about 90 to 95%. So you can imagine after living with, with seizures uncontrolled, being put on eight, nine, 10 different medications over five, 10, 15 years, um, we love to see those patients referred to our center because there are a number of centers around the country and we're one where we bring them in, we analyze the nature of their seizures and try to determine whether or not they're a candidate for surgery. Um, and that can have a life-changing effect as well. Okay, yes? So it depends on where the seizure focus is. Um, if, if the person, obviously this doesn't include people with like brain tumors because the brain tumor, you're gonna remove the tumor anyway. But sometimes people have these very subtle developmental anomalies or abnormal cortical regions that are subtle by MRI scan, but this is where the seizure's coming from all the time. The surgeon will go in and we'll sec out this region. Now you might say, that's not good, you know, brain important, you know, let's, let's be careful here, but this is not functional tissue. This is an abnormal focus. So the person's brain has developed in a way that this is not really required for normal function. That's been taken over by other regions of the brain. Okay, um, the, the most common surgery we do is actually resection of the temporal lobe, this region right here, which, which we described earlier in the discussion, where the seizure focus is coming from this area right here, um, and we will resect that area, leaving the part that has to do with language intact. Memory may be slightly impaired, but only slightly because the other hippocampus is sufficient for the majority of memory function in those patients, because this hasn't developed normally. So that would be another example. 
Okay. <laughs> so I, I'm happy to take some some questions. Uh, that's that's the end of the sort of the formal discussion. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, can hypoglycemia or decreased sugar uh, be associated with seizures? Yes. It can. It can actually lower the seizure threshold and cause seizures. But it doesn't. It doesn't regularly do that. So most people who have hypoglycemic ev events will not have a seizure, but it can be an inducer. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So the first question was incidence of epilepsy and whether there's any gender predisposition. The incidence of epilepsy is about one in 200 in the general population, and that's true all over the world. The incidence of actually having a seizure sometime during your life is eight in 100. A number of those are the febrile seizures in children that I described earlier, which are quite benign. Okay, and there's no male versus female pre 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 preponderance uh, overall. There are certain disease subtypes where you can see that, but but there isn't. The second part of the question was, what about these seizure detection dogs? So it is known that there are some animals, uh, and it's usually dogs, that have lived with someone with epilepsy, and they gain a sensitivity to the abnormal whatever it is in the person to be able to warn that a seizure is occurring. Um, uh, we don't completely understand why that occurs, um, but they're picking up something. I don't think it's pure electrical propagation through the, through, the, through the air. There's something about the behavior of the person that the person is probably not aware of, but that the dog picks up, and they, they can be great companions. Yes, in the back. So is there a connection between epilepsy and bipolar disease? So like migraineurs, there is this interesting overlap. We don't understand it. But one of the hot theories in, in psychiatry, and I don't know if Sophia or anyone else got into this in previous lectures, is that could it be that these um, episodic changes in behavior could be due to the firing of neural networks in deep parts of the brain? You know, it's, it's an interesting hypothesis. There's no direct evidence to date, but it is curious that in the last 10 years or so, one of the most effective treatments of a variety of, of um, affective disorders, depression and bipolar disease, are anti-seizure drugs, right? Now, the, psych the psychiatrists have taken what I think is too much of a leap in thinking and, there and saying, therefore, certain patients with these uh, emotional illnesses are having focal seizures. I don't buy it yet. I don't say that I deny it. It's just I just don't think the evidence is is necessarily there. And the second part of your question is, what about what about using electroconvulsive therapy as a treatment for depression? So shock therapy remains an extremely effective treatment of of uh, severe severe intractable depression. There's no question that it works. And I guess most of you know that the shock therapy is inducing a generalized seizure in a person. That's exactly what they're doing. They're using that seizure device I just talked about. Um, they're basically creating it chemically. Uh, the person is anesthetized so that they're not having the convulsions, but their brain is undergoing just what we drew before on the EEG. Okay? We don't understand why that helps depression, but it definitely does um, in, in really severe cases. Yes? Uh, the question is, are any seizures painful? Thank goodness, no. Um, the, only, the only situations where pain is a, is a big I issue are there are patients who have the focal motor seizures that go on for hours. And just from the fatigue and the buildup of lactate, their arm, their hand hurts. The other, the other example is after you've had a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, people usually don't feel very good. They develop a headache. Um, uh, their muscles may be very sore. I have some patients who only have their seizures at night in the middle of sleep, and they don't know it until they wake up the next morning, and they see the bed all disheveled because they've been, uh, and they sometimes have lost uh, urine, you know, because there's incontinence that can be associated with it. They have a headache, and they feel sore all over, like they've just gone on a 50-mile bike ride, you know, because they've been convulsing. Yes. The, the, uh, most of them can cause, and again, this varies patient to patient, um, dizziness, tiredness, some sense of cognitive slowing, um, uh, not feeling completely oneself. Some of the newer meds, uh, I've, I've noticed some, some subtle personality changes. I'm having spouses who come in and say, uh, 
you know, on behalf of the patient, I don't like this drug. You know, I mean, he was irritable before, but geez, you know. Um, so, so, so changes in sort of, uh, you know, sense of, of emotionality. And then there are other side effects that can have effect on bone marrow and, uh, you know, white blood cells and um, bone density, osteoporosis and so forth. Yeah. Well, just that, you know, I, I was emphasizing before how little we know about the true underlying mechanisms, the real biology of what happens in a group of cells and why they become hypersynchronized. And lo and behold, in at least these rare families, but it's real clear that they have a mutation in, say, an ion channel. You know, ion channels are what help control the level of excitability of a neuron. And some of these mutations, for example, impair the ability of an ion like potassium to exit the cell, which is normally required to inhibit a cell. And so just a subtle little change in, in, in the, in amino acid in the protein that makes up an ion channel will cause epilepsy in people. So it, what's exciting about it is it at least begins to give us a handle on how we might target drugs that are very specific to the, the particular disease in the person, you know, because at the moment, at the moment, our treatment of epilepsy is really, we see a person with a seizure, we, we have a, a number of different potential treatments, but we don't know which one's going to work specifically because we don't not know the real underlying mechanism. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, my, my quick analogy to this, I tell this to the medical students, and it's a way to emphasize how important it is to do biomedical research, is it's a story, to, this is quick. Two physicians are walking, along, walking down along a path next to a river. It's a beautiful morning. They've, they're friends, and it's just like perfect. They're having a great conversation, and suddenly they, they hear the sound of someone struggling upriver, and around the corner comes this person who's clearly drowning, and one of the physicians jumps in, swims over, pulls the person out, quickly resuscitates. The ambulance comes, and they go off, and the person sort of dries herself off, and they resume their pleasant talk. And five minutes later, again, sounds of someone struggling upriver, and, you know, the same doctor jumps in and pulls the person out and resuscitates and saves, and saves the person. And they continue their walk. It's a nice morning. And they're walking along, and, of course, another five minutes, another person, you know, comes around the corner, and the same doctor, you know, is still, still drying off, starts jumping in and looks at her friend and says, you know, I'm going to really need your help with this one. I'm just exhausted. And she sees her friend is just hauling up the path, going up the river. And she goes, where are you going? She says, the guy says, I'm going up river to find out who's throwing these people in. <laughs> right? So our ability to make progress in treating people with epilepsy, let alone any other illness in, in people, um, is, is completely predicated on our ability to make um, inroads in basic, basic and applied research. Otherwise, the current treatment in 2007 will be the same in 100 years. So my excitement about, you know, actually I d having, I didn't do it, but my colleagues who identified the mutation at least were beginning to get a handhold on why a seizure occurs in people. Yeah, what's the long-term effect? Great, great question. Great question. So, you know, is there any harm in having repetitive seizures? There is. Um, it turns out that we, we've learned that people who have really frequent seizures are, the seizures themselves can cause injury to neurons in the network. And it may be a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy that the neurons that are being injured are the ones that make the network even more hyperexcitable. So, so I have patients who I can't bring their seizures under control, and they know and I know that they're actually getting worse over time. And so, you know, our mantra in the, ep in the UCSF Epilepsy Center is no seizures, no side effects. That's our goal. Um, we don't achieve it in a significant number of patients, again, because of our lack of understanding. So, yeah, uh, seizures are, you know, multiple seizures are not a benign entity, except these three per second spike in waves seem to be pretty benign. So, but it's a different type of pathophysiology. But for the more general ones that I've talked about, um, we do get concerned. How about one more? Yes. Yes, I should have written it down. Grand mall, as opposed to petty mall. Okay? Well, thank you. You've been great students. Okay? Thank you.